Hello, this is Michael Altos, and we are starting our course on Applied Physiology for Certified Anesthesiologist Assistants. This is the introductory section, and we are on part one. We're going to begin with some basic introductory material here, starting with the discussion about cell membranes. You may remember that the cell membrane consists of a lipid bilayer. The bilayer has molecules with a water-soluble hydrophilic component and a lipid-soluble lipophilic component. There are lots of protein molecules that penetrate the lipid bilayer. Now lipid-soluble molecules can diffuse right through the lipid bilayer, but other molecules, charged or polar molecules, need some sort of assistance to cross the lipid bilayer, to cross the cell membrane. These proteins facilitate the transport of molecules across the lipid bilayer. Some of them are channel proteins and they're selectively permeable to only certain molecules. And the opening and closing of these channels can often be regulated by different electrical signals. We call that a voltage-gated protein channel. And sometimes when chemicals bind to these channels, it allows the channel to open up and move molecules through it. We would call that a ligand-gated channel. The channel proteins will allow diffusion through the protein channel, like an ion channel, and sometimes we'll have carrier proteins which use active transport, consumption of energy, in order to move molecules across the lipid bilayer. The rate at which molecules diffuse across the cell membrane is proportional to the concentration difference across the membrane, or the electrical potential difference across the membrane, or the pressure difference across the membrane. In general, when a molecule is moving down the gradient, when it's moving from a higher to a lower concentration, or from a higher to a lower electrical potential or pressure, it's easier for the molecule to move across that differential. Osmosis is a process by which molecules move across a semi-permeable membrane. We say that the membrane is selectively permeable because it allows water to cross, but not other molecules to cross. And so what happens is we get a concentration difference for water, which is to say, here on one side we have a sodium chloride solution in water, and on this side we just have water. Since this membrane is, se membrane is semi-permeable and it only allows water but not sodium chloride to cross, water will start to move from the left side to the right side of this membrane, in order to try and dilute the sodium chloride so the concentration of sodium chloride on both sides will be as close to equal as possible. Now this process actually is driven by what we call an osmotic pressure. We can think of it as the amount of pressure that would push back in the other direction in order to prevent water from moving across the membrane. And osmotic pressure depends on the number of particles per unit volume. We call this the molar concentration. And so we should just remind ourselves about the concept of osmolality. Osmolality is a kind of a concentration. It's the number of particles of solute that exist per kilogram of solvent. And for example, if we take something like sodium chloride, the reason we look at number of solute particles is because sodium chloride dissociates into two ions. So every molecule of sodium chloride actually makes two solute particles. Compare that with glucose, which does not dissociate, and so each molecule is one solute particle. Now in your blood, we have a variety of different solute particles, and taken all together, they create a normal serum osmolality of about 300 milliosmoles, or about 0.3 osmoles. In theory, one milliosmol exerts an osmotic pressure of about 19.3 millimeters of mercury. It's really a little bit less because there are some attractive forces between molecules that limit the amount of uh, osmosis that occurs. But the point is that our na natural serum osmolarity can actually generate quite a bit of force to move substances across membranes. Now, we were talking about osmolarity. Um, versus osmolality. Osmolarity is actually osmoles per liter of solution, and that's usually how we think about concentrations, is looking at the volume being the entire solution, not just the solvent. It turns out it's easier to measure osmolarity than osmolality, 
but in dilute biologic solutions they're very similar and so these terms can be used almost interchangeably when discussing human physiology. The next topic that we will review is active transport and this is simply the idea that we know substances can move easily when they go down a concentration gradient but when they need to move uphill against a concentration gradient in order to create a large concentration of one substance in that case we need to use energy like ATP and this is uh, shown in the sodium potassium pump where sodium is pumped out of the cell and potassium is pumped into the cell other strategies would be transporting of another substance downhill using a co-transporter or a counter-transporter where one substance is moved in one direction and the other substance moves in the opposite direction as seen with the sodium hydrogen counter-transporter. This diagram which is reproduced in your notes shows common normal values of concentration of different ions and substances in the extracellular and the intracellular fluid and we can start to appreciate that for example most of the sodium is in the extracellular fluid whereas most of the potassium is in the intracellular fluid and we can see the same for for calcium magnesium and other substances we can see that the relative pHs are different such that the inside of a cell is a little bit more acidic than the outside of the cell and so on now that we've talked a little bit about membranes and their integrity and the idea that different substances can be pumped to create concentration gradients we can start to understand the basic physics of membrane potentials when ions move down their concentration gradient they can create a charge gradient and this can continue until the electrical potential difference is so great that no more ions can move even though there's still a concentration gradient in this example we see that potassium ions which are in a very high concentration inside the cell and in a very low concentration outside of the cell the potassium ions are moving out of the cell down their concentration gradient and as they do that positive charges are building up outside the cell and negative charges are building up inside the cell and this continues until quite a substantial charge gradient exists and it eventually stops even though there's still a lot more potassium inside the cell than outside the cell the charge gradient is what finally stops this process now there are equations out there that can be used to calculate the electrical potential in these situations and we don't need to get into that right now we also know that membrane potentials can be measured in the laboratory with electrodes and other techniques but the main thing for us to understand right now is that we see two examples of ions moving down their concentration gradient until a charge gradient builds up now only the cell membrane needs to have a potential difference and we call this the electrical dipole and what I mean by that is the vast majority of the cell has an even distribution of ions right there's not like gazillions of positive ions inside the cell and negative ions outside the cell the cell is overwhelmingly neutral but right at the very edge right on the membrane we have a tiny fraction of ions that move enough to create this uh, membrane potential and we're going to see why that's significant in the next slides once ions have moved down their concentration gradients to create a charge gradient we develop a resting membrane potential in a neuron the resting potential is about 90 millivolts and what that means is that the inside of the cell is 90 millivolts more negative relative to the outside of the cell and this is done as we saw before really by sodium and potassium there's a sodium potassium pump that creates the concentration gradient pumping sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell and then they start to diffuse out they leak across the membrane down their concentration gradient and this creates an electrical gradient this creates the membrane potential and almost all of this 90 millivolts about 86 millivolts of it is due only to sodium and potassium we call this an electrogenic pump the sodium potassium pump because it actually moves three sodium ions into out of the cell and only two potassium ions into the cell so there's a little bit of um, electrical potential that's created by the pump itself this demonstrates over here how at the nerve fiber 
we see the electrical gradient right at the edge of the fiber. That is to say, the extracellular space is evenly populated by positive and negative ions. And the intracellular space is equally populated by positive and negative ions. But right at the cell membrane, we see we've built up a big positive charge here and a big negative charge here, and the same on the other side. And this is our membrane potential. We're going to stop here. If you have any questions, please drop me an email, talk to me in class, be in touch with me, and I'm happy to answer them. And we'll continue with the next recording.